at the Garden Market here on Anderson Island. It's absolutely fabulous. All these flowers. I got lettuce in here. I'm so excited. I want to get home and put them in a vase. Okay. Down in the barn other than hay. My, more of my time was in the chicken houses, cleaning the chicken houses. And they let hay in the summer. Yeah. I haven't had one of these in my hand in 65 years, but this is what we, this is how we started the job, right here. Feels, feels pretty good. This is the Johnson Farm. I used to work here when I was in high school. How old are you? I was 17 years old when I worked here. What kind of work did you do here? We did all kinds of farm stuff. We collected eggs, and we milked cows, and we cut hay. And what was your job? I had all the jobs. We had to collect eggs twice a day. Did you eat the eggs? No, we sold them. Well, Rudy and Oscar sold them. Who are Rudy and Oscar? Oscar and Rudy or Ruby Johnson. Um, I, yeah, I know who they are, I, I think. Oh, Oscar Moody Johnson. And I'm not sure who he is. Are you sure about that? Pretty sure. Oscar and Rudy. Who are they? Oscar and Rudy were the... They were brothers. Here at the farm, along with her yeah. sister. Ah. Howdy. Hello. Welcome to Johnson Farm. Thank you. It's good to be back. Be back? Yes, I used to work here when I was a kid. Really? Yes. Did yeah. you work for Rudy and Oscar? I worked for Rudy and Oscar. Who are Rudy and Oscar? They were the two gentlemen that owned the farm. They were our bosses. Their parents were Swedish Finns who came here and started this farm in the 1890s. What are Swedish Finns? That's really a good question. You know, Swedish Finns were people from Finland who were Swedish, if that makes any sense. But I know somebody who can explain that real good. Should we talk to him about it? Talk to him. Yeah, let's do that. We're here today up in Seattle at the Swedish Club, and we're talking to our new friend Gunnar Damström, who is himself a Swedish Finn and has a lot of first-hand experience and knowledge about why a couple of young Swedish Finns might have left their country and ended up on Anderson Island. The Swedish minority, had they moved eastward from Sweden? What happened was around the Baltic Sea, there lived a, a Stone Age population. And they inhabited the coastline in Finland and the Orland Islands. But then came the Vikings and wiped them out. So for about 200 years, the coastline and all, the Orland Islands were uninhabited. Uh, then the Viking era ended, uh, Swedish settlers, realizing the fertile grounds, uh, moved from uh, west of Stockholm to Åland and then gradually settling on the south coast and up north. Historically, Finland was not an independent country until after World War I. It was ruled for many years by Sweden until it was ceded to Russia in 1809. Gunnar told us how life was not all that bad for the Finns under Russian rule. The period under, under Russian rule started out really nice. When uh, Sweden ceded Finland to, to Russia in, in 1809, uh, the Russian, the Tsar, could at his will do whatever he wanted with Finland. He could have made it uh, uh, a Western province, 
but he elected in his great wisdom to retain it as, uh, as a separate nation. And this was uh, partly accompanied by some increased economic uh, activities. The, the Finnish uh, were renowned for producing pine tar. Pine tar was a commodity that was very highly priced. On the Ostrobotnian coast in particular, the shipbuilding and uh, lumber industry was, was very strong. And Her Majesty's Navy was very much dependent on pine tar to have their man of wars traffic the oceans. Then came the steel ships and the steam, steam engines. That, that pretty abruptly ended the prosperous time in, in the Swedish-speaking area of, of Ostrobotnia and on Åland. There was no more need for pine tar. And the people who had worked in, in, the, in the forests, pine tar and shipbuilding, and, and now all of a sudden they run under work. And there were very little prospects of improving on their situation. The coming of the railroad down to southern Finland that made emigration easy. And then at the same time, uh, uh, the Finnish steamship company had been founded with a business idea to transport Finnish butter to the UK. So now with these ships that traffic year round from the city of Hanko via Copenhagen to Hull, England, provided excellent uh, facilities for emigration. The Russians really put no restrictions at all on it. All you needed to do was apply, apply for a passport. It spread like, it spread like, they called it the America fever in Ostrobotnia. One of those who caught the America fever was a young man named Johan Jonasson. He was born in Permo, in the culturally Swedish area on the west coast of Finland in 1863. He was the fourth of 11 children of Jonas Andersson Sisbaka and Maya Lisa Matt's daughter. With no prospect of inheriting the family farm, he left home in 1883 at age 20. He traveled by steamship to Hull in England, took a train to Liverpool and boarded the ship Baltic for New York. We can only imagine how he must have felt leaving everything behind with no evident friends or relatives in America, no knowledge of English, and perhaps little more than the clothes on his back. He made his way to Minneapolis where he worked various jobs and in September 1885 he wrote to his family back in Finland, I will henceforth be known as John Johnson, signifying his transition to a new life in America. In 1889 John left Minneapolis for Tacoma, Washington. Meanwhile, in 1887, a young woman named Alma Maria Bowman packed everything she could into a wooden trunk and left her home on the Oland Islands, an archipelago situated between Finland and Sweden. She was 23 years old. She traveled on the SS Vancouver to Halifax and from there made her way south to the United States and traveled across the country by train. She reunited with her father, August Bowman, in Tacoma, where they joined the Swedish Lutheran Church. Later, her mother and brothers and sisters all joined them in Tacoma. John Johnson joined this church when he arrived, and on December 19, 1891, he and Alma Maria were married by the Reverend G. A. Anderson. John and Alma Maria made their home in Tacoma for a few years. A daughter, Alida, was born in 1893, and a son, Johannes Oscar, followed in 1895. To 
Tacoma had been transformed into a boom town when the Northern Pacific located its western terminus there in 1873. But times were tough following the financial panic of 1893 and the subsequent depression. Fellow members of their church, Banked and Anna Johnson, owned property on nearby Anderson Island. There they had established a wood yard and a dock from which they provided cordwood and water to fuel the steamships which plied Puget Sound in those days. Banked and Anna offered the Johnsons 40 acres of forest land on credit so they could start farming. John and Alma Maria would pay for the land by clearing it and providing Banked and Anna with cordwood to sell to the steamers. This deal was concluded in 1896, and around New Year's Day, 1897, John and Alma Maria moved their young family into a two-room cabin they had built on their new property. As the years passed, John and Alma Maria cleared more land and built additional barns, sheds, and pens for livestock and poultry. They also added to their young family. A third child, Ruth Marie, was born in 1897, followed by a son, Rudolph August, in 1903. By 1901, through hard work and thrift, they had paid off their debt and the farm became theirs. The children grew and attended school at the island's one-room schoolhouse. A new building was dedicated in 1905. Tragedy struck when Alma Maria died in 1907 at the age of 43. Alida, the oldest, was compelled to drop out of school and care for her younger brother, Rudy, until he was old enough to attend school. It must have been a relief when John's sister, Kasia, recently widowed, arrived from Russian Finland in 1908 and lived with the family for several years. Their sister, Hannah, who arrived at the same time, married Carl Peterson, the son of Nels Magnus and Hannah Peterson, who had settled on East Oro Bay. As the Johnson children grew, they were more and more able to help with the farm chores, and the farm prospered. A typical entry in Alita's diary, dated July 1st, 1911, states, I did my Saturday's work besides plucking four spring chickens. We're going to have eight on the 4th of July. A substantial new house was built in 1912 to accommodate the growing family. and John and his sons built a large pole barn in 1917. Besides chickens and cows, the farm was home to pigs and horses, which did much of the hard work of plowing and hauling timber, hay, and produce. Through all this, John Johnson somehow found time to be active in the community. For several years, he served on the board of trustees of the Sunni Lutheran Congregation of McNeil and Anderson Islands, and was sexton of the Anderson Islands Cemetery Association, as well as clerk of the board of directors of Anderson Island School District Number 24. Nineteen eighteen 1918 brought major changes to the Johnson family, as it had to millions of families all over the world. Early in 1918, 
Oscar was drafted into the United States Army and was assigned to the 362nd Infantry Division for training at the newly constructed Camp Lewis on the outskirts of Tacoma. In May, Oscar and his company boarded a troop ship and set sail for France. His division saw action in some of the heaviest fighting of the war in the Battle of the Argonne Forest. On October 9th, a scant month short of the end of the war, Oscar received a gunshot wound in the right shoulder and was hospitalized. He returned to the United States in a hospital ship in the spring of 1919 and was admitted to the base hospital at Camp Lewis on April 4th. After a lengthy convalescence, he was discharged in the summer of 1919. Through the years of Oscar's absence, teenaged Rudy served as his father's right-hand man. Meanwhile, Alita entered nursing school in Tacoma, graduating in 1922, while Ruth, who was working in Tacoma, met and married a Navy man, Alexander Lang, in 1926. Their daughter, Alma Ruth, was born in Bremerton in 1932. Because of his injuries and partial disability, Oscar was entitled to vocational training as part of his rehabilitation. He took advantage of this by enrolling in the winter short course in agriculture at Washington State College in Pullman. On January 2, 1921, Oscar boarded a Northern Pacific train for Pullman where he registered for classes in plant and poultry production, soils, principles of feeding, dairy herd management, livestock judging, and accounting. He completed the course and returned to Anderson Island in the summer of 1921. It is not known whether John Johnson readily accepted the new ideas about farming that Oscar brought back with him from Pullman, but at any event, John died in 1924, leaving his two sons to carry on the work of Johnson Farm. The young brothers worked together for the next 50 years, gradually expanding the farm and adding new pasture and buildings as time permitted. In 1930, they built two of the modern Shoup chicken houses designed by George R. Shoup of the Washington Extension Service and expanded their poultry flock to around 2,000 chickens. They managed the transition from horse farming to power equipment, acquiring tractors, balers, a light plant, and switching to commercially formulated chicken feed to boost egg production. Fisher's egg producer. I think this had a little something in it that made them lay more eggs than that. You know, I don't know for sure, but, but they were very prolific. Through the years, they assumed the role of providing the community with fresh milk and eggs, selling both at prices far below what the market would have borne on the mainland. They kept the checked eggs off to the side for the islanders so they could come by if they wanted them and they could get a, a lesser costing egg. You know, I don't think I ever saw anybody ever give them any money. They never paid for anything at the time that you bought it, either here or at the stores on the island. They have a book that they would have your name on the outside of it and they keep your track of your accounts in them, and it was pretty hard to get anybody to send a bill. The Johnson brothers were well known and respected on the island. They took part in community activities and, like their father, served on the cemetery board. Oscar was clerk of the school district and president of the Anderson Island Community Club, which provided the island with a library and managed the telephone system. On Sundays, one or the other of the brothers would often teach Sunday school or read the lesson during church services at the old schoolhouse. First time I ever met Rudy wasn't at the farm, it was at the Wide Awake Hollow. We'd go to have church services down there. Right. His, his job was to read a scripture every week. He'd be sitting in the back row, you know. You know, when farmers sit down, they usually fall asleep. <laughs> He'd be back there sleeping and they would kind of nudge him. Time to get up there, Rudy, and he'd get up there. 
Then he would uh, open his Bible, read the scripture, wouldn't say another word, go back and sit down. And <laughs> so Rudy was a man of faith. Meanwhile, they toiled long hours to improve their farm. Electricity finally came to the farm in 1961. In the mid-1960s, they sold a portion of their woodlands to the newly established Riviera development. The sale included provisions that the Johnsons would receive Riviera water from one of their deep wells. No more pumping water from the creek using an old-fashioned ramp pump. In later years, the brothers hired teenaged island boys to take on some of the heavy chores associated with haying and maintaining the flocks of chickens. They hired all the young people here on the island, worked at one time or another for the Johnson boys, and they were very, very good to their help. In the years before child labor laws and minimum wages, boys as young as 12 toiled long hours during the summer for 40 to 60 cents an hour. In the 1950s and 60s, dozens of these young men helped keep the farm running, and now, as senior citizens, they provide us with a window into the daily operations of Johnson Farm. Did you like working here? Oh my, it was so much fun. We worked really hard, but we had a great time. Did other people work here besides you? Yes, it was me and my two friends, Bob Gordon and Bud Brown. I was just a young boy, sweating in the summer sun, yearning for shade and a tall glass of water. Rudy was a good man, he taught me how to swing a split mall. Oscar was a big man, he stood tall and strong, yeah. Woke up, breaking in the day, putting on my boots, getting on my way. I'm working on a farm. Overalls in a wide brim hat, chewing snuff, not much to say. Here comes Rudy Johnson. I'm working on a homestead. Well, I'm thinking I'm at kind of the age that Rudy was when I worked here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so many years ago. It's good seeing all these guys. I haven't seen some of them for 40 years. Yeah, at least. I'm working on a farm. I started working at the farm in 1959. I was 11 years old, and it was uh, at 50 cents an hour. Well, I, I started a couple years ahead of you, uh -huh. and uh, I got 50 cents an hour. Or 10 years later, I got 50 cents an hour. Yeah. Yeah, it was so great working up here, and, and <laughs> they paid me 85. Really? Well, you were yeah. older and probably better. I was only probably 13 or 14. And I worked here all summer, and they gave me one paycheck. Yeah. So I divided it all by the hours I had. It was like 50 cents an hour. <laughs> so 69, I was getting. I started at 65 cents an hour. I got 50 bucks a week plus a little bit more. Is there any way you could describe a typical day uh, working in the summer? Okay, in the summertime, uh, it was up about five o'clock. The first thing that I would do would be to start a fire in the wood stove. Not only because that's how we warmed up the house in the kitchen, but that's where the hot water pipes ran through the back of the stove, so we wouldn't have any hot water unless the stove was going. After I got that started, I'd go to the woodshed and, and then refill the wood box in the kitchen. And then I would go down and milk two or three Jersey cows by hand. And after that, I had to bring the milk bucket up and bring it in the uh, milk room, pour it through cheese cloth into the jugs. Uh, and then I could have a cup of coffee, and by then it was getting close to 6 o'clock. I had three chores, yeah. splitting wood, getting eggs, doing hay, you know, oh, and, yeah. uh, cleaning eggs. You know, that's basically yeah. that was our job. No, we, yeah. we gathered eggs four times a day, four and we feed eggs. them in the morning and the afternoon. I just did the same thing every day. Yeah. You know, you're on the farm. you got to feed the chickens, gather the eggs, milk the cows, you know. And then, Simple life. And then repeat that. We just did hay two weeks in the summer. Hottest two weeks of the summer. That was brutal. 
You talked about cutting uh, wood. Yeah. Every time there was a storm, some of those trees would fall on the fences. There's two jobs. One, we drag, put a rapid chain around a tree, drag it up here to cut for firewood. Yeah. The second job was mending the fence. We put this fence in, then we take the tractor and stretch the wire and tamp the things down. And I came out here probably 15 years later. You're still there? Yeah. Um, it's all tipped over and overgrown with uh, blackberries. And that of all things just made me feel so old. <laughs> yeah, it looked like something out of history. In the afternoon, when I bring the equipment back and I have to grease the equipment, replace any of the blades that have gotten damaged, and then go down and milk the cows again, because you got milk twice a day, seven days a week. And then when that was done, fill up the wood box, split a bunch of wood, and then it'd be probably around 6, 6.30. Well, the responsibilities they gave us, you know, of driving the tractor, driving the car, driving the truck. I was 14 yeah. when I started my first year, um, 69, and, uh, I, you know, I didn't know driving for nothing. And Bob, he said, you're going to have to know how to drive when you get to Oscar and Rudy's. And, and uh, sure enough, they let me drive the truck, the car, the tractor. Uh, I remember he get hand, one day he said, I need some wood cut. Do you know how to cut wood? I said, yeah, I've watched my dad and I help him. We, we get wood on the weekends. Well, there's a little McCullough out there. Go grab it and, and then take the wag the trailer down and cut me some wood. And, you know, never showed me how to run it. I just went down there and started cutting. I trusted you and yeah. worked on yeah. a lot of equipment. They would rely on me, I know, to get the right tool you know, you couldn't go to town and get parts and come back, you know, yeah. that day. And um, when the baler would break down, you just got the tools out and you started working and they would tell you what to do. And I, it's the basic for everything that, you know, down the road, working with tools. Working on the car. How, how sensitive you have to be with a piece of equipment like the tractor and... The, all that's coming of age stuff, you know? I mean, when you're a kid, sure. at that age, all those experiences in your life, you never have had that, you know, especially if you live in town. It was a good good stepping stone for me, like Pat said, when you're my first job working on a farm, they work you hard. Yeah. It was, uh, I can't try to carry that through the rest of my life. Yeah, I've been self-employed my whole life. You're you, know, you, just, you just gotta pick yourself up and Put your boots on and get to work. <laughs> Those are the yeah. last guys I worked for. Those are the last guys I worked for until about five years ago. I just been working for myself ever. And this is the only job I ever had where when I was working for somebody was when I was working for Rudy and Oscar. Well, Bill and I were talking about coming up here, uh, how it formed our lives, the way we're built, even the work that we did. Oh yeah, and yeah. that was hard-ass work. I realized um, the impression that it left on me. My wife swears to this day that I got my work ethic working on this farm because every place I have worked since, and they've always commented, man, you work hard. And, but I had to when I worked for Rudy. I often hitchhiked from Fort Lewis to the Ferry Dog. I take, get my, uh, my bicycle right up here every morning. I used to take the boat. I took the boat across the Amsterdam Bay. We'd walk <laughs> up here and come in the back way down here and come down by the pond down here. Yeah, I did that the first two years here. When we walked, we'd carry home four quarts every night. I remember my mom telling me those clothes stay outside. So I'd get home every day and I'd have to leave those, I'd have to strip right there and by the door and leave yeah. those clothes outside. <laughs> and then the next morning I'd come out and put them put, on put again. Put them back on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, yeah. why wash them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, what good is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
haven't had one of these in my hand in 65 years, but this is what we, this is how we started the job right here. Feels, feels pretty good. We, we would grab these and, and uh, we'd head on in and fill them with eggs. And the, the hens were not happy about that. I've still got the scars from getting pecked, just part of the job. But, but uh, we'd go through here, we'd fill these baskets with eggs, and then we'd head on down to the egg room, and that's where you started the process of sanding them and uh, cattling them, make sure they weren't fertile. Then we did it twice, twice a day. We'd come up here in the morning and get them. We'd come back in the afternoon before we went, before we, uh, went home and did it again. This farm represented an amazing cycle of life. The chicks came to us in the mail in cardboard boxes. We would then take them to the incubator room which we had prepared with fresh straw and there was a, a heater in there, wood burning stove from what I remember. That's where they grew up until they got big enough to be placed in here. These hens would lay an egg a day, maybe two. When we noticed that the troughs were getting empty, then we would fill the troughs up with this product called Fisher's Egg Producer. I think this had a little something in it that made them lay more eggs than that you know i don't know for sure but but they were they were very prolific and this the room behind me was filled to the ceiling with fisher's egg producer i'm thinking that the chickens just lived for a couple years i think when i first started working here the house had been prepped which meant shoveled out that was one of our jobs too was to shovel it out it was about two years later that they had passed their egg producing years and so they'd call the man from Swanson and he would come by and I remember loading them onto the Swanson in the Swanson guys cages these chickens their useful life was not over because they would end up in your chicken pot pies too old to lay eggs but they tasted great in those Swanson TV dinners Remember, the worst thing you could see when you came out there in the morning was the Peterson Pie Man there. So that means he's coming to buy a house of chickens, yeah, and, and that means we're going to clean it. And we had those long wires that we catch the, catch the chickens with their feet. Oh, look, the chickens are kind of hard to catch. Yes. And so this would have a longer pole on it, and then you would hook it around the chicken's leg and... And pass them to this guy. And he'd feel for water. If they had water, he'd, he'd grab their head, break their necks, and just flip them over his shoulder. I remember coming down here with two, two baskets, like I said, twice a day, come through this door and walking down an aisle, there'd be chicken roosting, laying their eggs in these uh, little compartments on each of these walls. Remember the nice greeting they'd give us when we'd walk in the door in the oh, morning? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. They, yeah, it was not like having a family pet, was it? No. It was more like the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> no, they. Had to go to battle. They weren't happy to see us. We weren't happy to see them. I, I remember uh, once we got our baskets full of eggs, and if we were still alive, mm -hmm. then we'd walk out and, and, and we'd just take them down to the egg room. Yeah. Take them in there, try not to drop them. This old room looks uh, just like it did back in 64. A lot of the gear is still here. This is, this is amazing. The, uh, we'd come in here with our eggs, and then the first step in the process was to make sure they weren't fertile. So you had to do what they called cantling, and the reason they called it that was because there used to be, you know, a hole in the top of the paint can, and then there'd be an actual candle in it. But when I got here, there was a light bulb in it. We would take each egg, we'd sit around here, kind of a semicircle, and this would be in front of us like a campfire, 
and we'd put each egg over it and then you could tell if there were spots in there. If there were spot if there were blood spots in there, then that made made meant it was fertile, and so we just have to chuck it. But if it passed that test, then we would sand it. This is before this egg cleaning machine came in the second year I was here. When I was real young, I, right after lunch, sometimes we'd go down there and I got stuck with Rudy. Oh, yeah. And it's, he's, he's sleepy and I'm sleepy <laughs> and it's hot and you just ate and you're sitting there and Rudy's going to sleep. And, <laughs> he had a beat, you know, he had a rhythm. Yeah, oh, yeah. I know. I'm pretty sure I'm sitting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the worst thing you do is drop an egg into the bag. <laughs> well, there was a time where he was dating Lois. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he was so tired because he'd be up half the night visiting. And he, we'd sit down there and we'd start sanding and he would fall asleep and he'd drop an egg. <laughs> but we would sand it, candle it, and the egg cartons are still here. We would just judge for ourselves whether it was small, medium, or large. And we'd start filling up the filling up the egg cartons. And then the second year we got this newfangled machine, and this was this was great. You just you just uh, uh, put the egg in it, and uh, it would the machine would sort it and clean it and drop it down into small, medium, large, and extra large. It was a it was a great uh, great deal. You would load up that tr that ramp with eggs, and and then one would go in, and one would go oh, in, and as they're rolling down and they're clean now, you would set them into the each box. So what, what did the machine do? Wash them? It washed them, and weighed but them. and weighed them by size, and they would load up then all the town eggs, and they'd take them to town on Wednesday. I remember Wednesdays. That's when Wednesdays was when Rudy took the big truck and went into town. Mm -hmm. With the eggs. With the eggs. Yeah. And we'd goof off that day, kind of. Yeah, he was taking, he was going to Grandel's, wasn't he, to, with those eggs? In Stilicum? In Stilicum, yeah. 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 yeah oh, it, it, was, it was going full blast when I was here. I mean, they were taking those eggs in as soon as we packed them up. <laughs> This is the old barn. Wow, what are you doing here? This is where the cows lived and we took care of them. We made sure they had hay, we made sure they were milked every morning, we made sure that they were always happy. You know, I just, it's just great being up here. Yeah, first we gotta say yeah, cheers. <laughs> For Oscar, Rudy, and Alita. Seeing these old milk bottles, <laughs> yeah. you know, they used to give us one every day. Yeah, every day for lunch. Every day for lunch. They give it yeah. to you, there'd be that much cream on it. Yeah. And shake it up like a milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good. And cold, too. Yeah, nice and cold, fresh, probably squeezed that morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no question. When I started here, they were milking nine. Really? Yeah. Well, they, they had did 39 it all cows hand. when we were here. I mean, the most that I ever milked uh, was he'd have three. Yeah. Um, in the summertime, uh, it was up about 5 o'clock, and I would go down and milk two or three Jersey cows by hand, and depending on how easily they let their milk down, that could end up being 20 to 45 minutes. And after that, I had to bring the milk bucket up, then bring it in the uh, milk room, pour it through cheesecloth into the jugs. And then after school, if I was either um, tennis or wrestling or something, I had to get back here in time to milk the cows again. Yeah, it's five. Yeah, five o'clock. And then, and then Sunday too. Oh yeah, every day. But they didn't produce much milk. You never got more than three quarters of a, a bucket, even with three cows. We get a quart of milk for lunch every day. Yeah, yeah. But a quart of milk back then was, or a gallon of milk was going for fifty cents. Living out on the outer Amsterdam, we had a water company and we'd have a, a picnic. Oh yeah. After a while, we invited Rudy and Oscar to the picnic. The day before the picnic, they'd bring out the old ice cream machine and they'd get the milk and the cream and the sugar and all that stuff. Oh, out. Oh, and we'd oh, the oh, ice. Nice. 
and we'd make ice cream for that picnic for him. A, a leader would take the cream off, off of one of the bottles, and I swear it was half cream. Oh, oh yeah. And, and you would let this down, and let the cream run oh, in there, the cream oh. and then you could pull it out, and then you get it over your coffee or your cereal. Go like she would yeah. take just the cream and then grate chocolate into it to make me hot chocolate. Wow. And I could only drink <laughs> one cup. The cream was their, their main dairy product to town. They would take the cream to town and sell it. The milk was usually sold to people here on the island or fed to the animals. The, the second year I worked here, the summer, the, the county came out and told them they couldn't, they couldn't sell milk uh, to the, the customers anymore. It had to be, it could be cat and dog milk. And so the islanders would come up and buy cat milk. And then we'd go ahead, because it wasn't pasteurized. Oh, right. They didn't oh, have no. a way to oh, pasteurize their milk. It was so, their oh, milk. It was so yeah. much better not pasteurized. It's oh, not no doubt about it. I used to take the bucket and pour it through the cheese pot. Yeah. yeah. And that was it. One more sip. Well, here's to the farm. Here's to the farm. <laughs> <laughs> My job in here was to make sure that there was always hay, always hay for the cows. And so we would bring the hay in from the field and we'd hook it to a rope and it would go up in the air and across the top of the barn and we'd drop it at the other end and just we just made a big pile of hay, made sure there's enough hay for the whole winter. <laughs> Season usually began first second week of July. Yeah, it was two or three weeks long. Yeah, we just did hay two weeks in the summer, the hottest two weeks of the summer. That's about as hard as I've worked. In yeah, hoisting those yeah, little, up on the wagon. Old itchy hay, oh. 85 to 90 degrees out. We hayed up here. We hayed the airport. Yep. We did the airport, and we did that uh, the place out by Rick's out in Ora Bay. Yeah. Then we did the place by the culvert there, yeah. going mm -hmm. to Ora Bay. We did Lizzie's. Lizzie's, we did Ivel's, yeah, yeah. We did uh, Gene and uh, Lyle's place. I was 13 when I got to drive the baler, and Rudy put me down at the airport. I was there the whole day. You have the up and down of the tractor, then you got that baler with that arm and the separate engine. I got sick as a dog. I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize it, but I just was woozy when I got off that tractor. The fumes? The fumes? No, no just the just motion. The motion. Sickness. Oh, yeah. 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 Beat you to death. In the sun. Just. Yeah. yeah. That was, a, oh. That, that baler. That was brutal. <laughs> and, you know, I worked there probably 10 years after you did. This is a baler that Oscar and Rudy used back in the. Well, I worked on the farm in 1969. We'd shoot the hay in through here. It would, it would compact it, come back here, and then it would twine it up, and then just uh, shoot them out. And uh, it was an atrocious for breaking down a lot. Rudy kind of mumble a little bit. We fix the bail wire and do a couple more revolutions, and he always got her done. <laughs> Yeah. When he decided it was time to start, I'd have to start stacking, even if I had to drag him further. Down. Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah. He wasn't concerned about your comfort. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, relating earlier to the boys about when we'd uh, bring the hay in from the field. You mow it, you rake it, you bale it, then you stack it in the field to dry. Then we'd load it on a trailer and bring it in here. And Rudy'd be out there, and there was a, a big line that would go under the barn down the length here, and up and over, and those uh, big tongs back there. Those forks in the back. Those big forks would go into the, uh, the bales of hay. Eight bales. 
eight yeah. bales. And Rudy, that was his job, Rudy. He liked to be the boss, you know. He'd put him in there and then he'd raise his hand to Bill. And Bill would take off with a tractor and that line would pull the bales up. They'd click up there and we had a little the trip trolley, a little the trolley, trolley with a line on it, yeah. And they come up there and get on that rail, you can see it up there. And it goes shooting the whole length of the of the building, and then had a little quarter inch rope on it, you trip it, and the tongs would come out and you drop the You'd have to start in the back and drop the bales all the way in the back and start then once you got a load in, you'd have to uh, start um, uh, Stack. stacking the hay. Yeah. And then once you got it stacked, you'd go get another load and, and well, load as soon as as soon as you tripped it, the whole process started again out here, and we had to put the eight bales away, which was easy. Too much, but he'd let you know if he wasn't real happy with your effort. Rudy'd wake himself up snoring, uh -huh. yeah. and then Oscar get mad at Rudy. <laughs> for, they're both sleeping, but he blamed it on Rudy. <laughs> Rudy's expression when he got mad at you was "Gosh, wish fish hooks, man," mm -hmm. and he chewed snooze, and he'd get he'd say it so fast he couldn't keep the. Could the snooze in his lip and he drooled down his chin. Gosh, wish fish hooks, man, what are you doing? Why do you do that? What's wrong with you? And he drooled down his chin enough to yeah. wipe it away and your face would get red. Yeah. So Oscar was, was the kind of guy that just kept quiet and did what he did. Uh, Rudy handled the workers as far as if something had to be done, Rudy always gave us the orders, and then Oscar would always give Rudy the orders. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, came down. Yeah. Oscar was the boss. Yeah, he was yeah. the boss, and then Alita would come out, and they would all shift one one spot. He was the boss when she was. Oh yeah, she was. She was in charge. Oscar yeah. was definitely the boss. You know, he controlled the farm. You know, he would. They, they were both had very few words to say throughout the day. So let's say you wanted, they wanted you to do something, they'd say something, otherwise you just work. You know, they would, they would get a little angry at each other occasionally, you know, but not much. Yeah, Oscar had that voice like, ooh. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, what are you boys doing? He had a big presence. Oh, he did, oh yeah, he yeah. scared me. <laughs> yeah. As a little kid. Oh yeah. Rudy is a, a, a God-fearing man that um, had his principles, but I think that back then, that was when guys didn't tell their kids, I love you, son. It was more of a... Well, these are Finnish guys. Yeah, these are tough guys. Uh, yeah. So I mean, they had Oscar... a tough guy advantage, but there was a softer side to them, too. Sure. sure. Those two guys were good guys. Oh, yeah. They were. They were what they were. Yeah. yeah. But they were good guys. You will find you better guys. Oh, oh, what are you boys doing? Cows and chickens go. Well, there aren't any cows and chickens here anymore, Maya, because it's not a farm anymore. Now it's a museum. Why did it turn into a museum? Well, after Rudy and Oscar passed away, their niece, Alma Ruth, donated the farm to the people of Anderson Island, and they loved it so much that they turned it into a museum. Just as the 1960s are considered a period of social and cultural upheaval for America, this decade also saw unprecedented changes come to Anderson Island. The times they are changing.
Among these were the bringing of electric power in 1961, followed by the introduction of modern telephones, and the closing of the Anderson Island School District. At the same time with the coming of Riviera, one-fifth of the island was platted into residential parcels, and the number of lots suddenly swelled from around 100 to over 3,000. seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone they paid paradise put up a parking lot as young people raised on the island continued to gravitate to the mainland and the local population aged the collection of small dairy and poultry farms which once defined anderson island dwindled practically to extinction Oscar Johnson passed away in 1969, leaving Rudy to carry on the farm with the help of a few young men. The last of the chickens made the trip to Swanson's in 1970, and the community's last dairy herd dwindled to a few elderly cows. The egg farm um, part of their life when Oscar was still alive um, kind of ended, I think, after. Oscar passed away, even though we still had a few chickens, maybe a hundred chickens, it wasn't like it used to be. The community reacted to these developments with a mixture of enthusiasm, resignation, and alarm. With characteristic foresight and resourcefulness, they formed a park and recreation district in 1968 to take ownership of the island's iconic one-room schoolhouse and the surrounding woods. With their way of life confronting the reality of modernization, islanders began to think seriously about preserving their unique culture and history. Authors Bessie Kamen and Hazel Heckman produced books documenting island history and culture. There was talk of a museum. Among the first residents of the newly established Riviera was a retired Tacoma furrier named Lois Scholl. In addition to her incomparable skills as a seamstress and leather worker, Lois possessed a seemingly unlimited well of optimism and energy. You must remember this, a kiss is just a kiss, a sigh is just a sigh. Her friendship with Rudolph Johnson, steward of the last operating pioneer farm, gave birth to the idea of transforming Johnson Farm into a museum. Lois Scholes was the best thing that ever happened to Rudy Johnson. Oh, yeah. Because when she would come out, uh, I, I got invited over for dinners with them. I felt like a chaperone. Felt kind of funny. You probably were. What, were they she, trying to kiss and stuff? <laughs> I sure hope so. I mean, the man needed a kiss now and then, you know yeah. maybe. But she would make a dinner, and she was so sweet and kind to both of us, and, and she doted on him, which he needed that, softened him up a little bit. As time goes by. Lois and her friend Ruth Henry, another transplant from Tacoma, prevailed upon Rudy to allow them to convert his last functioning chicken house into the Chicken Co-op, an outlet for antiques and crafts in 1973. Insiders report that Rudolph, who had no direct heirs, used to chuckle at the notion of his farm becoming a museum. With Rudy's passing in early 1975, enthusiasm for the establishment of a museum took root in the entire community. A series of public meetings revealed support for the creation of a historical society with the purpose of acquiring and preserving the farm. Lois's nephew, Tacoma attorney John Van Buskirk, drew up the Articles of Incorporation and the Anderson Island Historical Society came into existence in July 1975. 
Rudy and Oscar's only surviving heir to Johnson Farm was their sister Ruth's daughter, Alma Ruth Lang, who lived in Tacoma with her father, Alexander Lang. Born in Bremerton in 1932, Alma had moved around the country with her parents before returning to Tacoma following Ruth's death in 1962. Alma Ruth and her father visited the farm every week to assist Rudy and Oscar with their chores. Well known to the community, Al and Alma Ruth were intrigued with the proposition that the farm become a museum dedicated to honoring the memory of the Johnson family. After discussions with leading islanders, they made the decision to donate seven acres, including the original homestead with its collection of outbuildings to serve that purpose. Their gift was acknowledged at a community dinner in October 1975 with the proclamation of Johnson Farm as a museum dedicated to island history and entrusted to the care of the Anderson Island Historical Society. In addition to Alma Ruth's original donation, John and Karen Parks have donated approximately 20 acres adjacent to the farm. This parcel includes forests, meadow and wetlands, nature trails, and a pond. In early 2019, we visited Alma Ruth Lang at her home in Tacoma, where Aidan Avey, a descendant of the pioneer Eckenstam and Ostling families, asked her about her childhood memories of the farm. The transition from a barely functioning poultry and dairy farm to a thriving museum and cultural center has taken many twists and turns over the intervening years. The one constant has been the continual refreshing of the volunteer workforce with newly retired islanders, armed with the skills and energy to preserve the farm and nurture certain traditions which have evolved during this time. Well, now there's lots of things that go on here, Maya. The islanders make a lot of good use of this museum. There's a beautiful archival building that shows the history of the farm and has lots of the old things that were used on the farm. From the early years of Johnson Farm as a museum, there was talk that someday new structures would be needed. Looking at the 14 old wooden buildings, it was evident that someday it would be important to have new facilities to store and exhibit the collection. 
At the Society's 25th anniversary meeting in the year 2000, Betty May proposed that the Society build an archival library. This initiative soon became embedded in a decision to form a Vision 2025 committee. This committee continued to meet between 2000 and 2007, and the committee secured a resolution of the AIHS board in March 2007, authorizing the committee to secure funding and begin developing plans for an archival library. Betty Mae Anderson and Rick Anderson uh, formed a committee to uh, start the planning uh, on that building, and so Betty Mae called my wife Lucy and I one day and said, would you be willing to be on the committee? And I said, sure, sounds like fun to me. So we joined the committee. Under the chairmanship of Ed Stevenson, the committee worked with several architects and considered many different types of structures. By 2013, the conceptual design of the building was established. Two chicken coops joined by a central hall. The next two years were spent developing plans and working with Pierce County Planning and Land Services to secure the necessary permits. Of special significance was the donation of the required energy study, proving that the building met the new Washington State Energy Code by Duane Llewellyn, a descendant of island pioneer Nels M. Pedersen. Permits were secured in the spring of 2015, leading to a groundbreaking ceremony on May 9th. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, and all of our special guests, we are really, really happy to see you here today because this is a really a historical day on the island. And now that we're finally about there, uh, we are sure happy to be able to kick this off. I have a kind of vision that I like to paint when talking about this building, and that is that the building will last for 300 years. And this is not a boast, but this is a goal. And uh, I'm here to promise you that we'll do everything we can within our power to, to make this a reality. We started the actual work on site the day after the groundbreaking. The very next day, uh, whites showed up here with their bulldozers and started scraping all the grass off of the site and leveling it up for us. Clearing of the site began in earnest the next day, and the foundation was in place by the end of June. A skilled volunteer corps was recruited under the leadership of project manager Ed Stevenson and Superintendent John Larson. I came to the, the ground-breaking ceremony, and it was going to be like a barn raising, and I could be involved in it, you know, and they just wanted volunteers and I was just more than willing to be part of that. I had no idea to what extent my value would be, but um, I enjoyed every minute of it. Thousands of hours of construction labor were logged by these men and women. Well, we have at times as many as 25 uh, workers on the site helping us and other times we had three. And so one of the big chores always was rounding up workers to be there every day because we worked every day. Uh, the average age of the group is so probably 75, yes. And every day we had a plan with uh, John Larson helping us with uh, his job as the uh, site superintendent. When we started the, the building, the archive building, Lucy enlisted uh, a big group of ladies who came down every day and brought soup and sandwiches for the crew so that we could have something to eat. Local contractors made impressive donations of time, equipment, and materials. The floor slab, 4,900 square feet, was poured in July and the concrete walls were completed by the end of September. So these walls are 14 and 1 8 inch thick. We have an 8 inch thick concrete uh, building in between those two wooden uh, stud walls. The amount of expertise that everyone brought to the project, it was uh, constantly amazing. Roof trusses arrived in September of 2015, and by year's end, the roof sheeting was in place. All in all, it was, uh, it was a very good project with very, very little uh, incidences of anyone getting hurt. 
Through the early months of 2016, the roof was installed, and in the spring, the walls were insulated and the exterior siding was added. It wasn't until we really put the siding on the building and the roof on the top and people were able to come in and see what we were doing that, that the majority of the people, I think, who had been against this project kind of got converted over because it is a beautiful building. The interior sheetrock donated and installed by Sessler Corporation was completed in the summer of 2016. We all see it when we come to this building, and that is all the landscaping that was put on the outside to beautify this, this whole area. And there are hundreds of trees and bushes that were put in, and a 37,000 pounds of box that were put around the edges that forms the, uh, the wall around the landscaping there. Jane Brokenberger and Jeannie McGover designed and did most of the landscaping that we have. The decision to clad the interior in soft, weathered boards, advocated and underwritten by Dave and Jeannie McGoldrick, was a significant turning point in defining the building's role in the community. On January 19, 2017, the archival building final inspection was approved and an occupancy permit was granted. The next day, the annual Anderson Island Art Show was held in the main hall. It was immediately apparent that the building could serve as much more than a facility for storing and displaying archives. The main room, dedicated as Stevenson Hall, in honor of the contributions of Ed and Lucy Stevenson, seats up to 200 people. Adjoining Stevenson Hall is the McGoldrick Library, which houses the Historical Society's collection of books on island and regional history. During construction, the workers frequently encouraged one another with the pledge that they were constructing a 300-year building. In its brief history, the archival building has hosted community events of all kinds. By the time we finished the building, we had uh, in both grants and donations from islanders and previous uh, islanders that uh, we had all of the money that was necessary to completely pay for the building, so we ended up with no debt, no residual debt at all. It's all paid for. The Islanders make a lot of good use of this museum. Every year there's a salmon barbecue, and there's a farm day where the farm produce is sold and there's a store where people buy things that are made by island islanders. It, and there's volunteers that have to take care of the grounds and mow the grass. There's a lot that goes on here. Make it up, honey. There are many annual events that have become traditions at the farm. The Island Art Show, a judged exhibition sponsored by Island Arts, presents the work of local artists in a variety of media. In the early spring, the Anderson Island Community Club and Young Life organize an Easter egg hunt at the museum. Needless to say, the farm provides ample hiding places and the kids have a blast. The first Saturday of May has in recent years brought island musicians to the archival building for a spring concert, presenting original as well as traditional band music. The programs include everything from bluegrass, folk, and country to hardcore rock and roll in one higher energy evening of foot stomping, hand clapping, and dancing sponsored by and benefiting the Anderson Island Association. Farm Day is held on the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend with an open house, a market with sales of crafts, produce, and baked goods, games and booths representing other island organizations. On the Saturday closest to the 4th of July, the delicious smells of flame barbecued salmon and ribs draw big crowds to the annual salmon and rib bake. Live music on the farmhouse porch, rides in the museum's Model T, kids games, 
and a silent auction provide the entertainment for a tradition that dates back to the boat club's salmon bakes of the 1950s. A popular tradition dating back to the 1990s is the outdoor concert presented in early August by the highly acclaimed Tacoma Concert Band. Their repertoire covers a vast range of pieces arranged for big bands. The community brings picnic dinners and refreshments and sits on chairs and blankets around the outdoor stage erected at the north end of the museum. A similar outdoor concert has sprung up in August where the musicians who presented the spring concert perform a summer concert. A tradition since 2018 is the Anderson Island Film Festival, held in Stevenson Hall in mid-September. Hi! Hey, great seeing you. Welcome to the second annual Anderson Island Film Festival. The event brings a delightful smorgasbord of films, ranging from local to international, unfailingly entertaining. Since the founding of the Historical Society, a fall tradition has been the apple squeeze. In the 1980s, the Society commissioned local craftsman Chet Palmer to build an electric-powered mill capable of turning out hundreds of gallons of fresh cider in a few hours. We usually get about uh, one gallon of juice or 20 pounds of apples. Islanders and visitors turn out to sample the hot spice cider, prepared according to Hazel Heckman's time-honored recipe, and take home a few jugs of fresh apple cider. The first Sunday in December has become the date of the holiday open house. The farmhouse is all decked out in holiday decorations. A team of bakers gathers to make traditional holiday cookies and authentic Scandinavian lefser, and the hot spice cider makes another appearance. The gloom of the damp, dark northwest winters is momentarily driven off as folks gather around the old pump organ in the living room and belt out their seasonal favorites. And then the farm rests for a month or two until things pick up right where they left off. Potluck season. The fourth Saturday evening of each month is dedicated to a member potluck, followed by a program of general interest. I'll show you what a man can do with a little hard work, a good strong back. On summer weekends and most holidays, the museum is staffed by a team of docents who guide visitors around the farm and share stories of the days gone by. Yeah, the kids, they, they, they come through here and ask questions and what, how they do that, how they make butter and stuff. And just awesome to, to go back in time. Up the road a short distance is Coop One, which houses a gift shop and a display area managed by volunteers under the leadership of Kathy Bailey. The store's been in operation over 25 years. A lot of it is consigned merchandise from island artists. Uh, then we fill in with locally made merchandise that we purchase. The other end of this building houses a display dedicated to Anderson Island's one-room schoolhouse, affectionately known as Wide Awake Hollow. In an adjacent building, Coop 2, the American Legion has established a display honoring the military service of Islanders. This building also houses the lowest showroom, which includes a commercial kitchen and a lunchroom where volunteers are served lunches on Wednesdays. Coop 2 also includes an area dedicated to domestic displays, including kitchen appliances, washing machines, and housekeeping articles from over the years. Give me a piece of land. I have 32 gardens and I have fantastic gardeners this year. We pick first thing in the morning so that everything is pretty fresh. Maintenance of the farm and museum is a year-round affair. 
20 acres and 14, 15 buildings. To maintain a farm status, we have the orchard, and then we've got the field down here that periodically we hay. Uh, the work parties come in once a week. Uh, we get anywhere from 10 to 16 people. Accomplished by a team of volunteers who lovingly care for the vintage buildings and grounds. Mindful of the importance of preserving a living monument to a former way of life and the pioneers who established it. Give me a piece of land, I'll show you what a man can do with a little hard work, a good strong back. Well, Maya, come on, we're going to miss the ferry. you enjoyed your visit here today. Oh, we had a great time. It was so great to get back at this old farm. Great, gosh. So nice to meet you. You come back anytime you want, okay? You understand that? Good deal. Well, have a good day. Enjoy the ferry ride. Thanks, Rick. I was just a young boy, sweating in the summer sun, yearning for shade and a tall glass of water. Rudy was a good man, he taught me how to swing a split ball. Oscar was a big man, he took tall glass of water. You know, when you talk about the cream, and I can remember my dad, mom would make him a wild blackberry pie, about like that. And he'd take and cut a chunk out like so and put it in the bowl and he'd take out two or three quarts of milk depending on how he felt and take a knife because you'd always have to run a knife around the top after it had been refrigerated because the butter fat would sit right there on the top to get it to pour mm -hmm. and he'd take and pick the butter fat out put it in there and then pour the cream out and do the next one pour the cream out you know that was his form of ice cream without the ice in it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just stuff you did back then you know and Every once in a while. It's always pasteurized, though, but it doesn't have to be mod enough. No. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> that would be good with coming up here, you know, after getting off and still in the Grandma and Grandpa, I'm home. <laughs> I'm going to say somewhere oh, right here. I'm sorry, the other end. Uh, go up. Feral cat. Go up a little. Yeah. 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 So many years ago I'm working on a farm Yells, you gotta fix it fast. Gotta make it through the summer. I'm working on a homestead. Four bits an hour, hard labor. Oscar and Rudy Johnson's farm. So many years ago. 